first of all, thank you for joining us today, uh, Mayor Young, uh, for this uh, conversation about uh, the budget and a few other things. I think I'm going to come at this, you know, a slightly different way than, you know, maybe you're used to talking about it, but uh, I think it's probably going to set us up. For one, I wanted to just acknowledge it feels like you haven't quite stopped campaigning yet. Obviously, you're not campaigning for the office so much anymore, uh, but you're out there campaigning for the hearts and minds of Memphians to do something. Uh, yeah. How would you describe what you're campaigning for at this stage in your administration? I mean, I, would, I wouldn't call it campaigning. I, I feel like I'm, I'm working to represent our city. Um, um, you know, I feel like our city needs a lot of healing. Our city um, is hurting right now. And I think it's important for me to be present, uh, for me to obviously acknowledge and address the, the negative things that we're dealing with, but also remind people um, that we have greatness on the horizon, that there's greatness that's still in us, uh, even as we go through some of these challenging times that we've uh, been going through. And I think as mayor, it's important that I champion that message and that, again, I'm present. That uh, gets to a question I was going to get to a little later on, but since you kind of already went there, um, there is certainly a, an administrative uh, a big part of your, your job is the administrative piece of it, but there is a piece of it that is inspirational. People looking to you to kind of set the tone, to tell us, you know, how we should be, I don't know, feeling or what, or to engage us in a vision. How are you kind of engaging with that part of it and balancing the, the public and the inspirational part of it with the administrative, got to crunch the numbers and, and run this city part of it? Well, you know, I've been working in local government for many years and I, I've led major divisions within government. And so the governance side is very natural for me, um, you know, working within um, the bureaucracy and, and working to make bureaucracy more efficient. The, you know, those are the reasons that I wanted to get into this work, that I wanted to make our systems work better for the people. Um, and so we spend a lot of time during our days making sure that um, we are getting government to operate efficiently. We have a great team. Um, and then I feel like the other side of my role is to be that ambassador for our city. I, I feel like the mayor really is the chief ambassador for our community. And it's important that um, our ambassador uh, be out there and, you know, spreading a message of hope um, and putting some action behind the words. Yeah, um, I have a. I tend to think there's a point when an elected official, especially administrative one such as yourself, uh, gets in the office and you get hit with some piece of information that kind of changes your perspective. You know, a candidate, not necessarily you, but a candidate may campaign on no new taxes. And then you get in the office and they're like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know about this. <laughs> what was there, what piece of information was it that kind of changed your perspective after you got in the office in terms of what would be needed, uh, especially on relative to the budget? Um, I think, so So I never campaigned on no new taxes, but I certainly had it as a principle going in that we would not raise taxes, particularly in my first year, because I do understand uh, how challenging of a time it is. Uh, but as I got deeper into the budget process, what I realized is that um, if we don't do something now, then we can put our city at a, a really, really risky place from a financial perspective. Um, and just to make it short, because it can be complex, but uh, we pull out of our reserves and we want to have a nice, healthy, rainy day fund. Our um, All of our credit rating agencies say that we need to have at least $80 million in our reserve. We need to ideally have $140 million. We're at roughly 100 this year. Um, and when we finished our budget for this first round, uh, we were roughly $90 million over. And so we cut it down. And after all of the cutting and then adding some of the new expenses, we're at $53 million over. And so if we pulled 53, we would be below where we need to be from a credit perspective. Um, and certainly we can cut. But I also understand that our community wants better results. And so I felt like it was important for us to go ahead and put us on a strong fiscal path. And in addition to covering the whole, also doing some things that are over and beyond what we have been doing so that 
um, our community can get better results. That means making our community safer through camera technology. It means cleaning up our community and investing in neighborhood-based cleanup crews that will be cleaning on a very regular basis, um, and then investing in our children in opportunities for them to be engaged after hours to get them off the streets doing some of the negative activities that we've seen in the past. I think you uh, kind of got to this and to my next question a little bit, but you can expand a little bit further is, you know, people may not want to pay higher taxes, but if they are going to pay higher taxes, you want to know the money is being spent properly, that, um, that the initiatives are working. So in addition to seeing cleaner streets or, you know, uh, longer hours at community centers for youth programs, what other ways will people be able to look at and say, okay, I'm paying more in taxes over here, but at least I'm seeing X in my neighborhood, on my street, in my school. Yeah, well, well, one is we want to make sure that we are enhancing service delivery. So, you know, the things that we do every day, we want to make sure that we continue to do them well and where we can do better, we want to enhance it. So things like uh, picking up the trash and paving the roads, potholes, I get a lot of questions around that. You know, how efficiently are we, we doing those things? And those things don't necessarily demand an increase, but it does demand that we are on top of our services. So we want people to see an, uh, um, better results there. We also want them to see, again, more people out cleaning, cutting grass, picking up trash. Like people need to see aesthetically folks out there doing this work because it makes them feel like their government is working on their behalf. And the blight contributes to crime. If it looks like no one cares in a community, people behave as such. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're changing that aesthetic feel. And then the reality of crime. Um, you know, a lot of the crime that we're seeing is happening because we have some idle minds that are occupying their time with, you know, stealing cars or breaking in cars and doing some of those activities. So the investment in youth is not just a feel good program. This is part of the crime prevention strategy. If you don't engage our youth, they will find another way to engage. And so we want to have structured activities uh, in our spaces for them. And then lastly, the investment in the technology. Um, that I spoke about, we know that um, as much crime as we have been seeing, it's still a small amount of people that are creating the most havoc, that are wreaking the most havoc in our community. And the quicker we can get them off the streets, the quicker we can bring them to justice, the, the quicker we can restore safety in our city. And so uh, this camera mesh technology that we're looking to invest in is going to allow us to be able to do that. You know, I imagine that uh, some of what you're asking people to do is to, you know, be able to buy into the vision, um, even if some of the programs may take a little while to kind of take root or, or, or for people to begin to feel the change. You know, you're asking people to, for lack of a better term, kind of suck it up for a minute until we get to the point uh, where, you know, you can act, people can actually begin to see this. Um, but people are feeling the pain now. They want relief now, so how do you get people to kind of buy into the idea of, look, I'm asking you for this now and it's going to be a minute, but if you if you ride with me for a minute and help me out, help me execute this, then here's what's going to be better down the road. How do you get people to kind of buy into, into that delayed gratification? It's really a matter of making the investments where people can aesthetically see things um, happening differently, where they can see their money in action. Uh, that's why I think it's so important to see uh, crews that are out on all of our major corridors on a very regular basis so that as you're going through your uh, commute to and from work or school or whatever things you're doing, you actually see these people um, that are out and about. So I think that helps give people at least some comfort. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we have to be more thoughtful around how we're policing in our community, meaning uh, how are we stepping up our investigative services and making sure that um, we are not just patrolling the streets, but we're also patrolling social media and thinking about, um, you know, some of the conversations that you see happening uh, online with uh, block parties or beefs between rival crews who are arguing over the internet. 
all of these are things that we want to be able to uh, assess so that we can predict where violence may happen. And those are the types of things that if we're doing that and we actually see the reduction in crime um, that we are looking to get, um, you know, part of my uh, goal is to have at least a 10% reduction in overall crime uh, year over year uh, to really restore peace in this community. And I think once people began to start seeing the fruits of that, then um, we'll see that it was all worth it. And, um, you know, we have some opportunities coming in two years where uh, we have a um, uh, what we call the debt cliff, where we will pay off enough debt such that $50 million available, uh, is available in our budget. Um, and at that point in time, uh, we can consider whether there's something else we can do around taxes where we have some more revenues available. But right now, things are tight for the next two years, and this is intended to really put us on a strong fiscal path moving forward. Crime and uh, violent crime specifically seems like one of those intractable problems that it's kind of hard to tie to a line item on a budget. It's hard to say if we spend this amount of money over here, then, you know, we're going to have X fewer kids drag, drag racing on the highways, or we're going to have, you know, fewer gun toting youth, you know, going into the pick up into the convenience store for people who that's how that's what you're looking at every day. How do you kind of, uh, other than, you know, convictions and arrests, how do you kind of measure that or, or kind of tell people, hey, that we're spending the money this way and this is how you can tell, even though it's not obvious? If I hope that that question makes sense. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. I mean, I think what we look for are indications of success. We know that crime is not going to be solved overnight, but we can get crime to trend in the right direction. Uh, where we're seeing year over year reductions. Uh, where we're looking at a certain period of time, summertime infractions are going down because we know that um, criminal activity has seasonality to it. Uh, the weather impacts those things. And so we know that if we get the right people off the streets, you're going to see less shooting. Um, if we get the right people off the streets, you're going to see less car break hands. Uh, and so our goal is to make sure that we're getting the right people. And then, you know, in conjunction with that, we want to work with our partners on the state, federal, um, county, district attorney, our, our uh, sheriff, and all these others that are involved in the criminal justice system to make sure that as we get these people off the streets from an MPD perspective, that the right people are staying off the streets um, and that, you know, they get, you know, the justice that is necessary for our community. And so that's an ongoing process. And I think people want to um, just see that reduction. And when they see it, I think they'll feel much better about the direction that our city is going. Let's hop into the alternate reality where, uh, it hadn't happened in this one, but the alternate reality where uh, the city council has approved your budget, you know, as is you've gotten what you asked for. Uh, how quickly, would people begin to see the results of some of, you know, what's included in the budget, um, you know, in weeks, months, years, what would be some of the signs that, hey, this is working or, hey, this isn't working? Well, my goal is for you to see immediate action. Um, and so, you know, I'm already instructing our team that, you know, I'm, I'm really putting myself out here uh, as a leader and saying this is what we need and failure is not an option. So we have to work really, really hard to make sure that um, if we're saying we're gonna have people out on the streets and neighborhoods and crews that are gonna be cleaning up in these communities, we need all of the grant agreement, all the agreements set up so that July 1, we are moving forward. July 1, when our new fiscal year starts, we're putting money into new programs at our uh, community centers that kids are going to be able to sign up for and parents can look into, that we're going to have individuals out in these neighborhoods cleaning up major corridors and streets, uh, that we are starting the process of implementing cameras and putting them up in um, different locations of the city. And so those things are intended to start immediately. When you see the reductions, when you see the, the product of that, certainly that'll take some time. But my hope is that, um, you know, by the end of the summer going into the fall, that we start to see the, the, the trending in the direction that we need. 
Uh, you've been talking about uh, the budget now for uh, at least a couple of meetings, at least one meeting, you yep. know, that you do out in the community. Uh, what are you hearing, you know, kind of from uh, the average uh, citizen, you know, say for instance in Orange Mound or Fraser or any of the other stops? What are you? What kind of feedback are you getting? Um, um, you know, I, I hear mixed things. I mean, there there are certainly those that are opposed to any tax increase. Um, um, some that are opposed because literally they can't afford it and they're on fixed income and particularly those seniors. And so um, I, I like to make them aware that there are tax relief programs that are available at the city specifically for seniors. So making sure that they're aware of that. You have others, um, particularly in the business community, that um, make the point that the more you increase taxes, the more it's a disincentive for uh, investment and it makes businesses want to leave, especially when we have the highest tax rate in the state. Um, and I certainly understand that. And I do believe that there is an equilibrium. But I also know that if we don't stabilize our community, if we don't make our community more attractive, if we don't address crime, if we don't do the things that are necessary, we will lose businesses anyway. Um, and so we got to make sure that our community is uh, fiscally solvent and that we are addressing our most pressing needs. Um, and then the last thing I hear is, some, is support. I hear support for it. But with that support comes the caveat that we support it as long as we're going to see results, as long as it's actually going to result in crime being reduced, as long as it's going to result in our community being more attractive, they are willing to support it. And so, you know, for me, it's just a matter of me ensuring that we execute um, if and when these um, this, this budget is approved. The I have to imagine that there's a, a chunk of the electorate of the tax base who let's just say live in a more affluent part of the city where property values may be higher and therefore they will be paying uh, more in tax, much more in taxes than some in uh, some of the more underserved uh, parts of the city where most, a lot of those resources need to go. And so you could imagine people in that, in that group saying, okay, I'm fine over here. Like the problems that are happening that need to be dealt with, and I do want them dealt with, but that's happening over there. How do you engage people in such a way that to help them realize that that's their problem too? If it's happening, you know, in Orange Mound and Fraser and uh, South Memphis, then it does impact Bartlett and Germantown and, and other parts. Well, I think it was it was probably harder to make that case 20 plus years ago when crime really stayed confined uh, to those areas that were uh, most impoverished or had the, the greatest challenges. But I think what we're seeing now is that crime is mobile and the challenges that we have in our communities are community wide and um, it's not going to stay confined to one geography. And that if we don't support all areas of our city, if we don't support all kids in our city, then um, the negative impacts will be felt across the board. And I think that is more apparent than ever to most in our community. And I don't think it's a hard case to be made uh, to say that you know these investments are going to result in a safer community overall. Thank you. And um, I kind of, in the, in the time we have left, I kind of want to pivot back to, to something from actually a, a few weeks ago and even a week or so ago when um, I was there when uh, you did the uh, dedication of the new reflection park at Martin Luther King. And obviously mm -hmm. the occasion talking about Dr. King and his life, um, you seem to speak very uh, passionately about introducing love and, and, and the power of love, of healing, of, kind of, of how to kind of have love uh, address uh, the pain. And, and I agree with you that, you know, the city and its people are in a lot of pain right now. Um, but it's love yeah. and healing and, and talking about pain is not something that you typically hear from an elected official, but it seems to be something yeah. that you're kind of leading with. Can you kind of, I just kind of wanted to give you a minute to kind of talk a little bit more about how or why that's, why that seems to be so central to the way you're approaching what you do. Yeah, to me, I think that Memphis is such a, an amazing community with so many great people. And 
um, such a diversity of people. And I really want to unify our city. I feel like we're much more powerful together. And love is the thing that can bind us all. And you don't hear, um, it's not the political thing to say, uh, to say that we need more love, but at the root of many of our challenges is pain. Like we have so many young, um, many of them African-American, um, young black men that are hurt. And it shows up in the form of anger. And it, it shows up in the form of, of masculinity and toughness, but they're hurt. And when you're hurt, anger is the reaction to pain. And I think that if we have more people understanding that these people um, that are running around here hurt and traumatized and traumatizing other people need love and attention, um, it doesn't sound tough. It doesn't sound novel, but it is exactly what is needed. And I think if we as people, if every single person just takes some time and um, you know, share some kind words with each other, it changes people's outlook on life and it won't help them all. I mean, I'm not naive enough to believe that uh, just because I give love that everybody's gonna give it back. But you giving that love will change some minds and hearts and it's gonna take everybody to get us where we're trying to go. Um. So is and I think the, the the council is certainly beginning deliberations on the budget. Yep, today. And uh, what would be your ask of uh, the electorate, of voters, of the citizens of Memphis, if if you're speaking directly to them? What what's your ask? I, I would say my ask is to um, support our city, support our young people. Um, I know that this proposed tax increase is. Uh, not something that anybody wants to do, uh, but I do think that it's something that puts our city on a strong fiscal path. Ideally, what would happen in our city is that we would be growing and there would be more taxes being uh, paid to our city based on the growth that we're seeing. Unfortunately, we're not in that mode right now. And in order to kickstart us going into that mode, it's going to take investment. Um, it's going to take investment. And it's going to take action. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm asking for this increase and I'm expecting you all to hold me accountable. Um, and we're going to work hard to get the results that our city deserves. Um, thank you, Mayor. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you want to make sure we get to? No, I think you covered it well. So um, I appreciate uh, getting the opportunity to talk to you. I appreciate the chance to talk with you as well, Mayor. Thank you for talking with us today. And I look forward to more in the future. All right. Thank you so much.